Welcome to the Block Church. This is our online experience, and we are so excited that you're here. If it's your first time watching, text TBC Guest to 94000. We would love to get connected with you and help you take a next step. Today is week three of our series called One Up, One Down, where Pastor is teaching us all about how to be disciples. And this week, we're talking about what it means to be a disciple and to be a learner, someone who's always ready to grow, always ready to learn more. So it's going to be a great message. Be sure to take some notes, and I don't want to keep you from it. So let's get started.
feel the fear come. I won't run away, even in valleys. Your presence is enough when I feel the shaking. I will stand my ground. Your presence is enough. You are with me. Father, you're for me. And fear will never conquer me. Oh, I belong to Jesus. I'm never alone. I'm never abandoned. Never conquer me, cause I belong to Jesus. Yeah. When I feel the pressure, I won't run away, even in tension. Your presence is enough when I'm in the mystery. Stand my ground. Oh, my God, you are enough. You are with me. Father, you're for me. We will never conquer. Oh, I belong to Jesus. I'm never alone. No, I'm never.
Welcome again. My name is Joey. I have the privilege of being the lead pastor right here. We're so glad you you made it. You made a good decision to be in church or to watch church. I want to take a moment and welcome our physical locations and our online location. Let's say hello to all those people. Welcome again. And we are in a series called One Up, One Down. We're talking about discipleship. Be a disciple, learn, make a disciple. Whole concept of One Up, One Down is is simply this. There's probably somebody or a few somebodies who are further along on their spiritual journey that you're gonna reach up to, that you're gonna seek out, one up. And then there's also somebody that's maybe not where you're at and not in a derogatory way, but you're gonna reach down and pull them up. This is our purpose when we call ourselves Christ followers, to find somebody further and find somebody that's not as far as you and and let's come together and grow in Jesus Christ. Today, I'm gonna really dive into a topic that I've really never taught about. It's really, it's about learning. And I, it was complicated, it was not complicated, it was hard for me to devote and figure out how to write a message about learning. And so I was just, where in the scriptures do we see somebody passionate about learning? Because you cannot separate being a disciple without learning how to be a disciple. And I was thinking about um, my journey. This is really, for me, one of the best ways to describe it. My journey is being a parent. And my son is four, and I'm trying to teach him things. I'm trying, I want him to learn. I want him to be hungry to learn. And, and you know, <laughs> I, I, one of our newest things we're trying to learn is roller skating. Do you remember learning how to roller skate? Anybody? And, uh, and so, of course, as a parent, you, you kind of become a psychopath uh, when uh, your, ch- your ch- children aren't catching stuff right away. Like, at least me, I'm like, oh my gosh, is there something wrong with him? You know, like, like, it's his first time with the skates on and he's not flying through it. He, he fell down. Like, what's wrong? Does he have a physical limitation? I mean, is, is he mentally not developing? You know, I mean, uh, you know, may, maybe it's just me. You know, I was thinking all these things. We go to the, we go to the skate rink I take them and uh, there was a playground and the first thing he sees is this massive playground at the roller skating rink like why would you put a playground at the skating rink to distract the children from learning how to skate and so the whole time he's like dad can we go on the playground no we're here to learn how to skate and you know I'm like what you know I'm like thinking why am I so why am I so intense about this? Like he's four. Like at some point he'll probably learn how to skate. So I'm like, we got to go around like 36 times before we play on the playground. And you got to stay up for like, you know, at least three minutes, you know, whatever. So anyway, we end up having a, a somewhat of, of a decent time. We had a horrible time. And then we played on the playground. And I was asking my son, I said, I said, do you like learning things? You know, he's four. So sometimes my deep questions that I ask him uh, <laughs> don't always amount to much. Like, can I have a marshmallow, you know? But uh, he's like, well, I don't always like to learn because learning isn't easy. Yeah. Oh, I'm like, bro, anything worthwhile is not going to be easy. Anything. Here's the thing. If you want to be something, you have to learn something. If you want to be something, you have to learn something. I want you to look at somebody next to you or type it in the chat. If you want to be something, you have to learn something. Ready? Go. If you want to be something, you have to learn something. It's important. I think one of the traits of a disciple is a thirst for knowledge. It's, it's, a, it's a, I desire to learn how to learn more about my Christ, my Savior. Disciples, friends, are in process. They are lifelong learners of the way. And there's a few things we'll learn to do and to be, and learning these approaches will enhance our life as a disciple it will take us to deeper places because uh, there's something that I believe that our faith does not have to become monotonous, boring. I believe that our faith is an ongoing adventure. But those who experience the fullness of their faith take steps of faith, but they learn how to do it. It's a learned process. 
So today, the, the title of my message, I, I promised you very simple titles, even though it, I like complicated, creative titles. The, the title today is Be a Disciple, Learn. Be a disciple, learn. It's very clear. If you want to be a disciple, you got to be a learner. Now, uh, the, the word discipleship, the word discipleship, the actual word never occurs in the Bible. Disciple is found in the Gospels and Acts, but Paul really never uses it. The, the, the term is ambiguous in English. So here's what it can mean. It can mean a few things. Firstly, it can mean my discipleship, like my own journey with Jesus. That's what it can mean. The second thing it can mean is helping others. The, the Greek word there, helping others, is to make disciples, the Greek word for that is to make disciples. And, and it can mean simply to preach the gospel and go convert somebody to Jesus Christ. We'll talk about that soon, but, but that actually is a commandment and a responsibility to convert, to lead others to Christ Jesus. We'll talk about that another time. Uh, another form meaning can be the whole process of conversion. Baptism and teaching the way of Jesus that is used in Matthew 28, 19. You know, go therefore and make disciples. Here's what it means, right? Baptizing the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded, that word commanded. In other words, to do this is a very long process. It's a lifetime process to convert someone, to baptize someone, to spend a lifetime teaching them to obey all that Jesus said, and for you to do the same. The whole process of sanctification, of growth. The bottom line is this. If discipleship, listen to me and look at me. If discipleship is a lifelong experience, then learning must be a part of our ongoing rhythm. If God keeps getting bigger, his kingdom keeps growing. If there is more to discover about God, then, then the, really to be a disciple means you are a lifelong learner about the things of God. So I want to go to a passage of scripture uh, about somebody who knew how to learn to do a few things, was a learner. Uh, and learn to do with these things and modeled it. And, and so what I want to do is I want to teach you the kind of things you should be learning that's going to enhance your experience. So I want to go to John chapter three, verse one, story of Nicodemus. And let's start in verse one. Bible says this, there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus and he said, Rabbi, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. So the first thing that I want to show us today is if you're going to be a disciple, you have to learn to seek. Learn to seek. Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was is the Jewish and wealthy council in Jerusalem, meaning he had great power, authority, wealth. They sat under the Romans' rule, but they had power over the Jewish people. But he was impressed by the signs of Jesus, and he needed to know more. He needed to seek him out. He wanted the truth, so he was willing to seek it out to find it. Not only that, he sought Jesus at great risk to his reputation and his position. Seekers, seekers, those who learn to seek, understand that when you really dive into the truth, it can disrupt your direction. It can disrupt your comfortable belief systems. It can disrupt uh, the ways that you will go about living and doing. When you really learn to be a seeker and get to the truth and the bottom of who Christ is, it might disrupt your way of life. Seekers are not afraid of the truth. They're seeking it. Seekers seek truth. They seek knowledge and they seek people. They seek people that can enhance their experience with God. This is the one up part of it. You know, for, for me, I sought out my pastor, who I call my pastor now, who's in Cincinnati. I sought him out for years. I met him at an event. 
I knew that I needed some spiritual leadership in my life before I planted our church. I saw him at an event and then I connected with him at another event. And then I asked for his phone number and then he wouldn't give it to me. And then can I get, you know, your email and, you know, sure. But it went to his secretary, you know, and it was like, it's like, I, but I just kept, cause I wanted what he had and I wanted to grow. I wanted to learn. And, and, and so I just kept at it for two years until he allowed me into his inner circle. And the thing is, is a lot of us, when we're seeking people who are going to enhance our life, our career, uh, who are going to uh, enhance our journey with, with, with Christ, we, we give up too easy. We, we think the, 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 the fairy of friendship and of mentorship is just going to appear to us. But that's not how it works. God, God wants to teach us to learn to seek because part of learning to seek the right people uh, means that you're also learning to seek the right theology. It's, it, they go hand in hand. Well, we don't give up uh, on, the, on, the, on the basic premise of a scripture without the context of a scripture. And, and same goes for, for the kind of people that we're seeking. When we identify somebody worth seeking out, it may not come easily. We may not be able to get a meeting right away. And, and to break that down in a more practical way for you, maybe you need to seek out someone that you admire in the church or at a specific location or a coordinator or a group leader or a location pastor or an assistant leader or whatever it is. And it may take some time, but, but, but you're not meant to just give up. You're learning the process of seeking. To learn to seek and pursue is part of our journey as believers. One way to seek God and to learn how to seek God is through prayer. Now, I don't want to teach a whole message on prayer right now, uh, but I do want to give you some of the forms of prayer. Because for you to even fully grasp your relationship with Jesus, you have to talk to him. The, the, the beautiful thing about Jesus is we have access to him immediately. When we start to pray, we have immediate access. But to understand the deeper things of our faith and the direction needed in our journey, that takes seeking. So, so here are some forms of prayer that I think are powerful that I think you should write down that are ways to seek God to grow and enhance your faith. Here's one of them that I like, confession. What is confession? It's offering your sin, struggles. It's asking for forgiveness and confessing your wrong mindsets to him. It's also confessing the right things about him and about your life, truths over yourself. We could even call those affirmations. Uh, intercession, that's aggressively storming God's throne with needs for other people. We get to know some of the deeper things of God when we seek God on behalf of other people. Sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night, God will put somebody on my heart, my mind. I know it's time to intercede when that takes place meditation. And I want to be careful here because some of us will use this to go into weird places and portals into the dark spirit realm and world. And that's not what I'm talking about, but you can meditate on God's truth and God's word and be still with your journal and say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. I've been doing that with my son. I'm trying to teach him how to seek God. I have prayer time in the morning. It doesn't matter how late he is awake. Somehow he finds me in my basement after two hours of sleep, and it's like, hey, dad, what are we doing? I'm like, well, I'm trying to read my Bible and pray, so you're going to sit here, and so I'm trying to teach him, hey, we're going to sit still, and for four-year-old, he's going crazy, but I'm like, hey, we're going to sit still, and we're going to try to listen. What is God saying to you? Be still, even if it's for 30 seconds. Some of you hate are freaked out by the silence and the stillness. Good. You should lean into that and try it more. Petitioning God, that's just asking God on your own behalf for yourself. Need to do that. Praying in the spirit, that might be praying in a heavenly language or asking for the Holy Spirit to pray through you. Uh, submission, this is a big way to seek God is literally coming to God and submitting and offering and putting all your current ways, your patterns, everything on the table. Say, God, nothing's off limits. Another way to seek God would be through thanksgiving clearly identifying what you're thankful for. And then the last one that I want to mention is travailing. 
or, or to travail, which means to weep and wait and repent, even wail before the Lord over your sin, over the sins of others, over the sins of our city, to travail, to wait. God, I'm not moving. A great example of that to travail would be maybe Jacob wrestling with God. I'm not, God, I'm not moving until you bless me, until you change me. I'm not rushing through this season. Travailing can be a way to seek God, not just in prayer, but in your journey with God. We are, we are, we are, I, I'm afraid to say it, but we, we can be a weak culture emotionally. And so the moment we feel just a sense, just a, just a touch of discomfort, we're out. And to seek God and to learn to seek God is to stay in the midst of discomfort. And here's Nicodemus going to Jesus feeling like there's some sort of truth that he's missing at the potential cost of his status, reputation, wealth. But he was in the process of becoming a disciple because he was learning and knew how to seek. In verse three, the Bible says, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again. You cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is like, what do you mean? How can an old man go back into the womb of his mother and be born again? And Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives uh, eternal life. Uh, so don't be surprised Excuse me, the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. Don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where you're going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. How are these things possible, Nicodemus asked. Jesus replied, you are, respect, you are a respected Jewish leader, and yet you don't understand these things? <laughs> I love that. I, I love this, this exchange of communication where, where Jesus is like, dude, you literally know the Torah, like you know the law, you, you know the word. The, the, the problem is, the problem is, is man, you know the letter of the law. You have a religious spirit. I'm the spirit of the law. I'm, I'm the fulfillment of this stuff. You got to be born again. You, you got you to gotta dip in the waters of the Holy Spirit. You, you need a friend. You got to learn. And, 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 and what, what, what Nicodemus is doing here is he's asking the right questions. He's showing us something. He's not just learning. He's not just showing us that we need to learn to seek. He's showing us that we need to learn to be teachable. To be teachable is one, is, 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 is one of the greatest aspects of a disciple. But it means we've got to learn to be teachable. Remember, Nicodemus is a well-respected scholar of the Torah. If, if, if he was overly prideful, he probably would have got up and walked away when Jesus challenged him. But he was, he was a learner. He was a seeker. He, he, he's showing what it means to be teachable. And I just want to make a statement. Age, status, accomplishments should not interfere with continued growth. There's always a solution. There's always a solution. And teachable people learn to find the solutions. I also want to say this. Those who are closed-minded, listen to me. Those who are closed-minded are often double-minded. Understand this. If you are closed-minded, if you are closed-minded, it means, it means, and when I say closed-minded, not teachable. I'm not saying you're not blocking out the wrong things. I mean, you're closed-minded to something getting into your spirit, the right things. That means that you'll waver and blow with the winds. So I want to teach you right now how to be teachable. This is how to be teachable. It's going to change your life. You have to learn how to drop judgment and biases. You can't be teach teachable if you're always judging other people and if you have a bunch of biases. Oh, 15-year-old can't teach me anything. Oh, this preacher, you know, can't teach me anything. I can't learn from that person. They're not, they don't have as much money as I do. I mean, you name it. We, we can go down the list. They don't have the same cultural background that I do. They don't know what I've been through. They didn't grow up on this block. 
Well, you're being closed minded. You got to ask good questions. Nicodemus, in this moment, he's asking good questions. You got to listen to the answers, even if it stretches you. See, there's, there's a principle of, of asking versus arguing. Some of you, some of you, you ask questions just so that you can argue. I want you to hear that. Look at me in the eyes. Some of you literally ask questions so that you can argue with people. What you've got to learn, if, you, if you're going to be teachable, you have to ask questions and then bite your... <laughs> you got to bite your tongue to the point where you're almost bleeding <laughs> so you can shut up long enough to hear what somebody is saying. You got to decide that the way you always knew it might not be the right way. The measure of true teachability is application and then it turns into love. Learners are lovers. They really are. They know how to love because they're learning that there's more to life than the negativity, the drama, the brokenness. There's, there's, there's hope in the midst of, there's a solution. And solutions give us hope and what it lasts, faith, hope, and love. In Proverbs 12, the scripture says, to learn, you must love discipline. It's stupid to hate correction. I'm, I'm grateful in this story, we have Nicodemus who's like, okay, you're right. I'm, I've spent my whole life, probably a lot of wealth. I've spent, I've spent all my time you know, thus far learning about the Torah and somehow I'm missing this. I mean, if, if, if he hated correction, thank God he knew this passage. Thank God he understood the concept of this because he would have just got up and walked away. But he understood that it's stupid to hate correction. Please hear me. Please hear me. It is stupid to hate correction. If you hate, you are a fool. You are a fool if you hate to be taught the right way. I don't want you to be a fool. You're not meant to be a fool. You're a people of God. You're a Christian. You're a Christ follower. We should not re represent foolishness. We represent wisdom. But you can't be wise and hate correction at the same time. And that's just the truth. In verse 19, the second part of it, they continue on in their discussion and the Bible's like, God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness more than the light for their actions were evil. Verse 20, all who do evil, listen to this, all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. Verse 21, but those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Oof, this is good. So, so we got to learn to be seekers. We got to learn to be teachable, but we also have to learn to be accountable. Th this is what I'm seeing here because when you're a disciple, listen to this. When you're a disciple, you want the light to come to you and expose all the darkness. You love accountability. If we are left to our own, own vices, if we are, I almost said devices, which could be advice. If, if, if we are left to our own self without other people in our life, without accountability, okay, then, then, then the darkness will naturally overcome us. But wise people, seekers, those who are teaching, disciples want the darkness to be flushed out of them. And so they're choosing and they love accountability so that others can say blind spot, area of weakness. You got to grow here. Sin, this is sin. I don't know if you're living pure. Your, your marriage could be in trouble if you stay on this path. I want you to think of something that, you know the phrase, oh, that hurts so good. You know, like, like being a, a Philadelphia sports fan. <laughs> it hurts. So good. Uh, another example, maybe scratching a mosquito bite or a deep massage 
or for some of you, popping a zit. <laughs> Working out or running. You know, the air cups on your body or like even acupuncture stuff like, or your eyebrows getting waxed <laughs> or love, love, love hurts so good. What I'm saying is something that causes you pain, but the outcome is good. That, that'd be a good example of, man, this hurts so good. So many, listen to this, so, l- hear me on this. So many of you don't ever go to a block group, which by the way, will launch very soon or meet with someone who can counsel and help you because you're so afraid to be exposed. Listen to me, listen to me. Disciples of Jesus face the inner darkness and bring it to the light. And sometimes what that means is getting other people in your life to help you see what you cannot see. The word of God does that. It's a mirror. This is the conversation that Nicodemus and Jesus are having, but it's, it's, but it's an example even of the kind of conversations that we can have. We talk to Jesus, we talk to others. This is accountability. It hurts so good. It's short-term pain for long-term gain. Short-term pain for long-term gain. Deci- I want to say this again. Please hear me. I want you to look in my eyes the best you can. Disciples of Jesus know that it's necessary to face the inner darkness and bring it to the light. I want to teach you a little bit of how to be accountable or confession. Confession. What is confession? Well, you expose yourself to your accountability and it provides freedom and healing. James 5, 16, first part of it, Bible says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. So I want to be clear, Jesus forgives our sin, but confession to others helps you heal. You don't go to somebody else to ask for forgiveness or to be forgiven. You go to Christ Jesus. Although you might need in relationship to ask for forgiveness for areas that you've done wrong. Those are different things. But you want to be made right with God, you go to God. However, if you want healing in your life, often it's connected to other people. So here's some rules of confession. You should write this down. Stop hiding. Don't wait for your leader to ask something or bring it up to you. Get ahead of it. Find someone you can trust and who won't enable you to make excuses for your sin. The worst, people don't love you if they enable you. Mom and dad, mom and dad, you don't really love your kids if you don't discipline them. And if you enable them and make excuses for their environment, you're doing nothing for them but creating victims. You got to create a rhythm. Weekly or monthly conversations of confession is best with people we need. I have a rule. I also have a leadership teaching uh, on my YouTube page called TMI versus TBH. Too much information versus to be honest. So when you're confessing, not every detail is needed. Okay. Now, sometimes it is, but not every detail is needed. The overall theme is what matters. You might freak somebody out right away when you're giving them too much information. So a a rule of thumb as you're confessing, TMI versus TBH. Be honest, but you don't always have to give all the information. Man, this is so practical. Isn't this so good? Last thing I'd say is use wisdom. Know who to go to and when. It's okay to go to a leader or pastor, even for certain things. You might need advice as to how to bring something to your spouse. So go to somebody else who's married who you can trust and say, I've got an issue I need to bring to my spouse. How do I do it? Use wisdom. All right, so I I wanna recap and I wanna close here. Disciples of Jesus are learners. They're lifelong learners because it's an ongoing process. We learn to seek. We learn to be teachable. We learn to be accountable. We love it. But the last thing, and I, I wanna close with this. It's John 19, 38. This is after the death of Jesus. Bible says afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. When Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. Verse 39, I love this. With him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to follow Jesus at night. He brought about 75 pounds of perfumed ointment made from myrrh and aloes. Following Jewish burial custom, they wrapped Jesus' body with the spices in long sheets of linen cloth. 
What do we see here? We see somebody who became a disciple. And what we see is, is he learned to love Jesus. See, he, he's modeling how to seek. He's, he's modeling how to be teachable. Jesus is teaching us here how to be accountable. But we see that loving is actually a learned characteristic. Many of us won't actually love Jesus or our journey with Jesus as much as we will if we keep following him with perseverance. And so disciples learn to love God. There's an element of love when you give your life to him, when you experience him. But if you stay in it, you love deeper and you love longer. Same with marriage. There, there's romance and that's a good emotion. There's sex and that's a good emotion within marriage. But there's love that, you know, you've heard the line that time is undefeated. And if you keep loving and you keep learning to love, you realize and you learn that love goes even deeper. Nico was, Nicodemus, Nico, whatever you want to call him, was there at Christ's death, but that's not proof of his love. The proof of his love was his extravagance and his generosity towards Jesus' body. He knew Jesus was the Messiah at this point. He truly loved Jesus after all. He wanted to be generous because of his love. It's a great sign of being a disciple. Love is a sacrifice giving without return, without, without needing a return. But it took him time and it's okay. That's why I said earlier in this series that your journey with God is not necessarily uh, how fast you go, but if you stay in it. I just wanna close by saying a few things. You know, Jesus was extravagant in his love towards Nicodemus. He saw the spirit of the law and it, and it blew his mind. It's, it's always Christ who loves us first. And then we observe it, we feel it. I bet you, I'm just, I'm just putting my, my, myself in Nicodemus' shoes, but I, I bet you Nicodemus was watching Jesus minister to the thief and going, that's radical love. I bet you Nicodemus is watching Jesus die innocently for him and going, oh my gosh. I bet you he's watching Jesus fulfill the prophets with his words and going, this guy's the Messiah. He's observing, in a sense, the temple tearing in two. He's acknowledging when Jesus says, oh, Father, forgive them. They, they know not what they do. Nicodemus is literally going, I know not what I'm doing right now. I've got to learn. Love is a learned trait. And he learned to love him. And we're always responding to God's love, always reacting to Jesus's grace. It's learned. Sometimes we feel it. Sometimes we choose it. Do you hear me? Sometimes you feel the love of God and you feel, feel your desire to love God. Sometimes you choose it. That's why we learn to love. We learn to love what he loves. Listen to me. We learn to love what he loves, the right things, his word. We love what Jesus loves, people, his church, worshiping the father. It's learned. And if you listen to me, I'm, I'm closing with this. If you have a love deficit in your life, you must evaluate what you currently love. If Jesus doesn't love it, then there isn't room for it in your life. And this helps you love God and the things of God more. You know, there's a couple extra biblical accounts of that rumor saying Nicodemus was eventually run out of town and stripped of his title. He may very well have learned to receive him and to follow him. And Guys, following Jesus doesn't always mean rainbows, sunshine, and roses. It means that you might get stripped of some worldly accolades for, for some eternal glories. And every location, I want you to stand to your feet. And if you're watching online, please stay with us. If you are far from Jesus, this is your moment. If you're not following him, Today's the day. If you are far from him, maybe at one point you, you, you were following Jesus, but you're not anymore, or you've never invited him to be the Lord, the leader, and the savior of your life. Today is the day. This is the moment. Now is the time with every head bowed, every eye closed, including online, you're listening to me. If you are far from God, if you need to get right with God or begin a journey with God, if you hear my voice and that's you, would you lift your hand right now, right now? All over our locations, people are lifting their hands. Online, show me a hand emoji in the chat. Do not miss this moment. It's time to get right. It's time to be a follower. It's time to learn what the life and the adventure of following Jesus is. If you've lifted your hand, I want all of our congregation to pray this, but especially you. Can we pray, Jesus, Jesus. 
Thank you for the cross. Thank you for coming for me. I want to follow you. Make me a disciple. Forgive me of my sin. Be my leader and my savior all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you are saved. Heaven is your destiny. Your best days are ahead. And while it may not get easier, it will get better. Come on, let's give God a praise today. What a great message. I hope that you were encouraged by God's word today. If today you decided to follow Jesus, we are so excited for you and we would love to hear about it. So be sure to email us at amen at theblockchurch.org so that we can get you connected to the best next step for you. If today was your first time watching, text TBC guests to 94000 so that we can send a gift to you and get connected with you. It's also not too late to give. You can give by texting TBC Give to 94000. Thank you so much for watching today. We hope you have a great week. Can't wait to see you next time. And now stick around for next steps with our lead pastor starting right now. Hey, thanks so much for staying for next steps. My name is Joey and I am the lead pastor here at the Block Church. And in 2014, my wife and I started this church with a dream and a vision to revive every block. What's that mean? Well, we just wanna see Jesus transform our community, our sphere of influence. And we believe as you connect to the power of the gospel and the hope of the local church that your community, your sphere of influence can be revived. And that's really our dream and our vision that we've seen happen over the years. And while we have physical locations throughout Philadelphia, we now have an online location. In fact, that's what you're attending right now. And people who attend our church via locations or online, they do a few things. People attend more than they miss, and that could mean online. Uh, they serve like Jesus. Uh, they connect by going to groups and they give and see life change happen through their giving. Something I wanna to highlight to you today is a way to connect. We have a new to the church online group just for you. It's a way to learn more about these four areas that you can participate in. And I highly and strongly encourage for you to connect uh, at that new to the church online group. Now, what is your next step today, right now? It's simple. If you feel interested in the Block Church and our mission to revive every block, I'd love for you to text TBC Next to the number on your screen. It's that simple. TBC Next to the number on your screen. Follow the prompts and then we'll talk. We'll connect about what's next for you here at the Block Church. I'm really excited and thankful you joined us today. And I'm believing that the best is ahead for you and in your life. God bless you. And we'll see you real soon.